Second, we have uh, a colleague from Pakistan, uh, Dr. Asim Sazad Akhtar, who combines a, not a rare, but, but a very uncommon quality of being a political scientist and also a political activist. A professor of political economy, he is going to tell us the democratic dimensions of diaspora at the interface of the TV development in Pakistan. Dr. Akhtar. Um, before I begin, I have an admission to make. Um, I was uh, very excited to listen to or to have TN Srinivasan lecture me again after almost two decades, um, having been a graduate student of his at Yale. But um, my juices only really started flowing in the previous session, uh, with apologies to TN. Um, and I suppose that reflects that uh, my, in, in my training in, in political economy, uh, the proclivity has been towards politics rather than the economics. Um, I wish uh, I could respond, I had time to respond to some of what Richard Armitage said vis-a-vis um, -vis Pakistan and, and what goes on, um, and the sense of, and the extent to which uh, what he was suggesting about how Pakistanis think and feel um, was representative. Um, my short uh, response, he's not here, would be to suggest that um, Pakistanis are not the only people in the world who have problems with American foreign policy. Um, so while, when I was initially asked to speak at a conference on the South Asian diaspora, I presumed I would be taking up topics that reflect um, my broader academic and political concerns. Maybe something on the sociological makeup of the Pakistani emigre population, the colonial beginnings of the modern South Asian diaspora, perhaps even the so-called war on terror. Uh, I was therefore a bit taken aback when I was told that my presentation should center around the theme of media. Uh, I'm not an expert on the media by any means, and I, neither do I share the optimism of those who believe that the private media is the proverbial protector of the public interest vis-a-vis -vis the state. Um, when I think media in Pakistan, unfortunately, I'm afraid I don't have uh, very many good things to report. This may seem odd, um, because Pakistanis in the audience and those amongst you who are not Pakistanis but who follow what goes on there probably think that the media is one of the very few silver linings on what is admittedly a pretty bleak political and social landscape. It was, after all, not that long ago that the country's recently emerged private TV media played a central role in the movement that ousted yet another general from power, Pervez Musharraf, and more generally, there is a widespread belief amongst Pakistan's educated middle class that the private media represents liberation from the state media, which monopolized public information flows up till only eight or so years ago. I must confess that my task today has been made a great deal easier by that paragon of the public interest, Rupert Murdoch, <laughs> and his rather pedantic son, James, the father and son team, along with a fairly big supporting cast, has done more to do debunk the neoliberal myth that the media is a public watchdog than even a very vociferous critic of, of neoliberalism such as myself could have done. Um, it's unfortunate that it takes scandals of such magnitude for the crises of 21st century capitalist modernity, and more specifically for the present purposes, the corporate media to be brought into the spotlight, but that's by and by. The point I wish to make is that if the world's biggest and most powerful media mogul is willing to do just about anything to keep selling tabloids, that then Pakistan, the fact that Pakistan's TV media revolution is more of a corporate rather than a democratic one shouldn't really come as a surprise. Notwithstanding the, the Pakistani media's apparent commitment to democratic transformation, as evidenced by its televising of the anti-dictatorship protests of 2000 and 2008, what has stood out more about media reporting over the past three years is the manner in which the country's most powerful institution, the military, has remained a virtual sacred cow. Relatedly, the so-called ideology of the state, which accords to the military its special role, has also not been subject to serious introspection within media circles. 
In contrast, the politicians and their apparently incurable corrupt streak, um, and, and these politicians maintain, I should insist, a very tenuous hold on some, and, and, I, and I repeat, some uh, affairs of government. These politicians take a beating on TV channels and in newspaper cartoons on a daily basis. So what does all of this have to do with the diaspora, you may ask? Well, first of all, I'm glad that um, in previous sessions, I, I was beginning to get a little bit worried at the top of the show. Um, but but um, in some of the sessions, um, we did sort of break down what segment of the diaspora we may actually be referring to here. Um, and what we are referring to, or at least this gathering, is, is obviously the well-to-do politically inf influential segments of the expatriate population, rather than construction workers, domestic maids, and taxi drivers. So this particular segment of the diaspora, and this thing is an important distinction to make, because I believe that the urban educated middle class has not played an altogether progressive role in Pakistan's recent history. And in some profound ways, the private media's politics, um, if I may be allowed to suggest that the media is a very important political actor, is actually quite similar to that of the middle class. And as, as an aside, I suspect um, that to some extent at least, um, this, 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 this mapping or this sort of similarity between political perceptions and, and, and preferences of the middle class in Pakistan sort of comes across in, in other South Asian contexts as well. So I'll, I'll digress very briefly to give you a sketch of how our urban educated middle class conceives of politics and by extension what their conscious or unconscious political preferences are. First, there is a perpetual bashing of the so-called feudals and tribals that keep rural Pakistan trapped in a time warp and the majority of Pakistanis illiterate and politically subservient. Second, our political culture is so corrupt, corrupt to the core rather, the blame for which falls squ squarely at the doorstep of our politicians, um, who also happen to, feudal, to be feudals and tribals, that there is an inherent tendency to prevent change, or to prevent change from taking place. And third, economic development, and particularly the need for integration into the globalized economy, is the key to getting ourselves out of this rut. I share none of these three assumptions, as it turns out, but most of the educated middle class um, tears them to the hilt um, and believes them so firmly as to, in the past at least, not so much recently, um, but in the past, has actually provided some kind of mandate, and, and I include in this middle class our, our diaspora, um, a mandate to support the periodic return of military rulers into government. Um, it's not so easy to do that anymore in today's Pakistan, although I wouldn't rule that out um, in years to come. Um, but more generally, there's a deep cynicism about politics and politicians, and a tendency to reduce what are very complex social and political problems in a multi-layered society to rather simplic, simplistic problem of administration. Um, there's, there's, so to speak, almost a messiah complex, um, a, a complex in which sort of we're waiting for someone to come, come down from the proverbial sky and clean up all the mess. And that's why from time to time, we support the idea of a military man coming in in his prim and proper uniform, suggesting that he's going to do exactly that. Nowadays, the designated messiah is the chief justice, um, who's still living off the, the, the good vibes of, of the anti-dictatorship movement. Um, that a Supreme Court judge cannot possibly be the wellspring of good policy is reason enough to be skeptical of the middle class gaze on Iftikhar Chaudhry let alone the fact that many of the Chief Justice's recent pronouncements hardly count as apolitical and unambiguous assertions of the public interest. So what I really want to suggest to you is um, that to a certain extent, the media's tendency towards sensationalism, um, towards the bashing of politics and politicians, even though a certain amount of bashing is necessary, um, is, is a little bit of a case of the tail wagging the dog. Um, but when I say the tail wagging the dog here, I suggest a particular segment, a very well-to-do segment, a very influential segment of the middle class, an urban educated middle class that views itself in direct opposition to, as I said, this time warp rural part of society. 
which apparently doesn't change. I think that the diaspora and this, and this educated middle class in, in general, um, I, I, was I was following what, what many of the speakers had to say um, in earlier sessions. And I was surprised at the extent to which the emphasis was on economic integration, um, on improving, let's say, trade, um, improving um, even people-to-people -people contact. And I was, I was taken aback by how little emphasis there was on politics and the political dimension. And the fact that there is, as I, as I believe, have been rather dubious politics on the part of the middle class. Um, whether in Pakistan, I would suggest to a certain extent, from what I know about um, the rise of Hindu nationalism in India, to a certain extent also in India. I think that it's, it's essential um, if there is to be the kind of impact of the diaspora on South Asia, and particularly in, in terms of India-Pakistan relations that we all apparently crave. Um, I think, which is sort of to, 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 to parrot what the, the chair was just saying, I think that, that uh, there needs to be a very distinct, coherent um, people's movement. And when I say people's movement, I don't just mean sort of track to diplomacy. I think the educated middle class, I think the diaspora needs to take on the state on certain issues. The Indian diaspora needs to take on its own state. The Pakistani diaspora needs to take, its own, uh, take on its own state. Um, a plethora of issues come to mind. Um, obviously, in Pakistan today, we struggle with questions of militancy, but I think that relates back to broader questions of the ideology of the state, which I hinted at earlier. Similarly, I think the Indian diaspora needs to be much more proactive in thinking about sort of the excuses that are often given by its state to avoid um, moving on and taking the initiative. As um, I, I recall in the very first session, um, one of the speakers suggested that the Indian state needs to do. In, in suggesting that, that the diaspora has a political role to play, what I am suggesting is that political attitudes and preferences need to change. There needs to be a, a recognition that there's been very deep sociological changes that have taken place in, in Pakistan at least. We're no longer, as some people believe, a rural society. Um, up to almost 50% of our population now lives in some form of urban settlement. Those sorts of changes have engendered a whole host of social changes, which, which belie this notion that feudals and tribals continue to dominate the political landscape. And to the extent that they do, I think the educated middle class bears some responsibility because of its repeated support of so-called apolitical, technocrat-inducing military rulers who show up on the scene every once in a while. So what I'm suggesting to you here is, of course, not that necessarily everyone in the, in the diaspora or the educated middle class shares these political opinions, but that a significant and politically influential segment does. And that's the segment that happens to um, clap with both hands and both feet when our TV media bashes politics and politicians. Um, and what we don't find is the diaspora and our middle class clamoring for more serious investigative journalism, um, demanding that the media tell us what's changed in our societies, demanding that the media tell us more about society rather than perhaps just the play of great powers or intelligence agencies at the top of the tree. Um, and that will, if, if and when that happens, I think our media will start to perhaps play a more responsible role, play a more investigative role. And then there's a shot um, that some of the things that we want our governments to do or that we um, continue to invoke uh, or suggest our governments should do, that they will actually do because politically and socially influential folks, um, including in the diaspora, will, will, will suggest that there's really no other option. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Akhtar, for introducing the political element in, in diaspora consensus, because this is true that since morning we have been emphasizing on cultural and economic aspect, uh, and it is uh, a, a fairly reasonable and good plea that South Asian diaspora must also get together to reinforce democratic values and perhaps correct the states back home in their democratic functioning, uh, 
but to what extent your wish of TV and media really playing this role come through remains to be seen.